I will leave the floor to you. Thank you. So I'm Steve and uh, I'm gonna take you through this uh, presentation. And first of all, I think I wanna introduce some of the guys that you can see and girl, a girl you can see on the screen. We uh, have Habib, he's the one with the glasses. And then we have uh, Uram and Rashid and we have Selma. And they are actually the reason why we're doing all of this because they're not usually sources or people that will um, see on screen and it's usually not people that will give the camera the mic and the editing too because they we actually have a problem building a trustworthy relationship with them to let us tell their story and this is why we're doing it because we want to be the representative of them so when we started this project, I mean, Tuto Ustland is a regional media house that do a lot of different things. We work with news and the web, we work with news and television, we work with news and social media, but we also have a lot of content building on other platforms, and that is especially for the youth. So when you do a, a show on YouTube, for instance, it's not, it's not necessarily newsy, but what we could see was that we were actually only reporting or uh, communicating with ethnic Danes, and that is not our public service responsibility. But instead of training all of the journalists inside to have a different mindset and do things differently, we actually decided on, okay, we wanna do some experiments first, and we wanna build a connection with a production house outside that can do the experiments with us and be a lot more risk, uh, take a lot more risk in how they actually create content with the use and have an office outside of our building out in, a, in an area where a lot of these uh, young people live. So it's much more connected. So what we did to begin with was that we needed to understand the target group. We needed to understand, okay, how is this minority youth group different from the ethnical Dane youth group? And how are they then diverse um, from each other? So we did a lot of, uh, oh, now I can't press, yeah, now here. You see, we did a lot of um, personas that we could actually create a lot of content for. And now this is in Danish, but I'll, I'll talk to, um, I'll try and translate some of them. So we have uh, the criminal guy, and this one up in the corner is the, is the criminal guy in Spain. He's the one who is not uh, deeply involved with crime, but he could be at one point. And then we have the student, we have the stay-at-home mom, we have the entrepreneur, we have the ambitious one, uh, that's a uh, medical, yoga, uh, and so forth. The one that actually wanna go away from these areas, rural areas, as fast as possible and, <laughs> and not look back. And then we have the, the, one who, the ones who really wanna be a part of the debate in the society. And then we have the pop girl, uh, and then we have the worker. And all of these eight types of personas or people are representative, and we cannot communicate the same story, and we cannot communicate the same content, and it cannot be sold or told in the same way. So we actually have to be really aware, okay, what kind of stories is, that, is it that we want to tell? And if a stay-at-home mom communicates something, it will probably be the other stay-at-home mom, so watch it, because they can um, relate to her. And that's how we work with this all the way through. So we don't have one host that tells the same stories, and we don't have one way of telling stories. We have many different hosts and many different ways of telling stories, because we need to relate to different kinds of people. So this work has been very important, and this has been the foundation of what we're standing upon, that we know who we are working with and for, to represent them in the best possible way. Because some of the assumptions when you take, um, this could perhaps be a bit defending for journalists, uh, but 
if you take a classical journalist from our media house and put them into Gellerup, that is one of these areas where they live, for instance, there is this assumption that if you want to do really good content, you either have to put it in a um, movie, I mean, a TV clip or something, or you have to write an article. You have to put it in those formats that you learned in school. But many of these young people, they've never been presented to these formats because many of, many of them in general terms are from homes where it was not DR or TV2. There was a, in the television, it was Al Kishia that, do, that does news in, in different ways. Or if they've never been presented for a newspaper with the format of an article. So for us to even think that we should write an article, we're way behind of what they're actually using. But what they are using is social media and they're using it it's in the same way as the ethical things. So we really had to put away all of our assumptions on how valuable uh, journalistic uh, content is created in the more um, old fashioned term and then focus on, okay, how would we create valuable content on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook and so on. So we started with actually thinking, and this is the experiment that you're now introducing to, because it's changed a lot during uh, the two years where we've been working. And this is also why it's at an external production company, because they can change much faster than we can at a, than a, in a media house. They're much more agile. Um, but what we started with was that, um, we had this room and everything was live and then we would have different debate and people would join the debate live but already there we could see that the youth had already left facebook so the audience that we were actually uh, targeting there was not the ones that we were actually there to debate with so we sh pretty fast shifted into taking some of these young people who were sitting in the chairs debating or telling their stories to actually show us the stories really raw with a camera in their hand, asking questions that they, perhaps many journalists would actually never ask because they knew the sources. So if you see on the right next to the four guys sitting in the chair, you have um, Oma, who is a, who's been involved with, with crime uh, in his younger days, he's still pretty young. And he had a talk with three, three other guys who've been deeply involved with crime, but now are on the other side. These guys are people that um, Tibetan Ushland would never, ever, ever have access to, ever. But because Omar knows them, he can go for a walk with them. And then their buddy can actually hold the camera and record this. And they've never done it before. So the quality is not good if you want to be high production, but the access into these questions and reflections are extremely valuable in our opinion. And this is good content. And then we also had the ambition, okay, but we still need to be a bit, a bit more professional than actually just throwing cameras at them and they're going into the field and telling stories. We have to, um, focus it a bit more and spend a bit more time on the storyline and what it what is it that we want to say so the next picture is Selma she's a one of the first or she is the first in Denmark headscarf mod uh, she was spotted before she took her scarf on and had a lot of uh, discussions or a lot of uh, dialogue with her modeling agency when she took the scarf on but she decided that she could be a model and she's a badass woman and she's a, she's she's really fun to work with. And then two of her friends said, I think if you ask them back a year and a half ago, they would say that they wanted to go with Selma to Paris uh, for Fashion Week on a vacation. And then they convinced the production company to pay for it. But... <laughs> For, but for us, I mean, for them to have fun and think of this as an vacation and have the camera in their hand and ask the questions that they wanted to ask was actually a very, very good thing. So they went to Paris and they prepared a lot of questions from home. And I was just talking to one of the girls yesterday, Yasmin, 
that was doing the, the recording and uh, she said that she had to throw all the questions away because she could say, she could, from the, what the questions they've prepared, it was very obvious to her how Selma's emotion should be. So Selma, when I ask the question, you have to look a bit nervous because that's what they want. And, <laughs> and they luckily for us decided to just throw the whole thing away and then ask the questions that they actually felt relevant. And then when they got back home, then they had to work on the storyline and edit it. We learned a lot during that show. And then we took that and it became much more, you can see in the next picture, I mean, the thumbnails are much more YouTube-ish. I mean, we noticed with Salma that creating these short video content series that can, with humor or insight, can create a conversation and can create a debate on how it is to actually be minority youth was the way that we could communicate with them. But right now, what we see, and this is also why it's very interesting to do Gallop Live, is that right now we are doing things that all of the other productions companies are looking at and scouting at. I mean, so when we have talents that performs well, they want to do something with them. And for us, this is perfect. And now we need to change. Because then they can do that. So right now, we are at this point where we need to figure out what Gallop Live has to be and how it needs to change because we, our role in this media production um, environment is to challenge and move the barriers on how we work with um, the minority youth and how we can give them the power to tell the stories. So. I think one of the answers is the talents and the youth that we're working with. And now I ask you how to spread the talents and get them involved. And I think this is the really hard question because this is network and this takes a lot of time, but often because Denmark is a pretty small country and Ustjylland, and Aarhus especially is a pretty small city compared to others. and the, a minority youth here, a lot of them knows each other or knows people that know each other. So this is for our advantage. So these people are not people that we've been saying, um, apply to be a part of Gelo of Lime. you could do it here and they will demand so much from you and we'll pay you this and this and this. It's much more about saying in Gelo of Lime you can do something that's really fun. But you have to decide yourself what it is that you want to do. You have to come up with your idea and we'll support you. And we'll create a team around you that can actually make sure that it ends up with something that we can show. But a lot of the things that we end up doing in Gala of Life are not at the at a quality and a and it is not for the target group at Tivito Ustulen. So a lot of this content is never carried is never carried in to Tivito Ustulen. It actually stays at Gelob Live, and that's perfect. But these young people, one of the challenging thing is because from what I say now, it could it they could sound like Gelob Live is just a perfect spot to do a lot of great content. But this is also what is the most challenging thing because. You have to be sometimes a mom and a dad. You have to be a, a pedagogue. What is that? You have to be a trained in how to, how to actually work with <laughs> you. And then you have to work with people who don't understand how to record, how to edit, and how to come up with ideas. So you also have to be the master teacher of all of that. And that could be challenging. And the, the will to work can be challenged because a, of family relations, because of the way that they've been used to going into schools. They can be challenged with them having other jobs and doing this on the side. It can be challenged with a, what would my friends say if they knew that I was doing this and so forth. 
So we're doing, a, we, we spent half time production and half time nursing in this community management field. So you have to be aware that it takes a lot of time, but it's also worth it. Because I think what we've experienced is that the, um, how do you say that, uh, the really well integrated minority youth, they, they are actually, um, they have a habit of looking into traditional media. So they're not the ones that we're targeting necessarily, but the youth that um, that you could say is the parallel society in some ways, they're the ones that we're working with. Yeah. Um, so when you have these young people here, it also, uh, um, challenge you with a lot of uh, ethical um, questions because sometimes these young people uh, have been or we don't know if they are involved with crime we don't know or sometimes we know but uh, we also uh, sometimes we, sometimes we don't know who they're related to and that could be uh, people that we wouldn't necessarily trust as sources. And then these young people also have a very, very um, split way of looking in, in our ethical Danes opinions on looking at uh, telling the truth. So for instance, when you talk about uh, drinking, they'll say that they don't drink. When their camera on and the microphone is on, they don't drink because they're Muslim. They don't drink. Their parents don't think they drink. When the microphone is turned off, they say that they drink. So we have two <laughs> different realities. And if we say that you should always tell the truth, we wouldn't be able to tell any stories. Because it is really split when their parents what they tell their parents and what they tell when they're inside their apartments what the, the life they live there is completely different from the life they live in school or at their job and if we say that they have to be honest the whole time and tell us everything and be trustworthy I'm really serious. We couldn't do any stories. So we have to balance this and we have to be aware on how we know that it's truth and where we know that it's not. And ugh, there's a lot of ethical discussions here. But it's really important that you take those and you're in dialogue with them the whole time around this. Instead of saying there's this hard line. Yeah. And then I want to show, share some do's and some don'ts that we are at right now, because I think there, there are a lot of things that we've learned in the last two years. And for instance, some do's that we need to have people around that can build a community with energy and the focus, because this needs to be fun and it needs to be a, something that gives them a plus in life. This does not have to, it, it cannot be draining. It has to give them something to work with us. And that can be challenging, but this is something we have focus on. And then we also have learned that the one that operates the camera asks the question and the person who edits the movie calls the power on how the story is told. And this is extremely important. If we come, I'm not a journalist, but if the, 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 the journalist in the production, the trained journalist in the production company says, this is the right answer or this is the right question to ask, he takes or she takes the power. So we need to be aware of that. And then we can have dialogue around it. But the one that decides has the power. And then we need teamwork because especially the talents here, they can't work alone because they don't have the methods and they don't have the skill sets to do them. 
And then we need to have clear deliverables all the time. I mean, what are we expecting of you from this task? And we need to have supporting questions to make sure that people are saying yes to the right things. So when we say, do you want to edit this movie? We also need to explain how much time we think it could take. So they're not drowning themselves because they don't know how long time it would take. So we always have to ask the question to make sure they understand what they're saying yes to in the right way. And then we need this youth club vibe. And that's also about the energy. It doesn't, um, if it's draining, if it's something you have to all the time, that means there are things you have to, but it, we really need to have this vibe about this is a cool place to be. And then, of course, this is a no brainer We work with ideas that the talents come up with themselves. A, and then we have to work in and with the chaos. And this is a don't, you don't have, you cannot control the chaos. <laughs> Many of these young people, they start their day at three or four o'clock sometimes. They, they can sleep in. And many of them hang around at night because they live in apartments in very small families. So if you want to talk with them, it's, it's at nine o'clock at night. And if you want to press it into an eight to four <laughs> schedule, you will never succeed. And if you, wanna, if you want them to be on time, you will never succeed. I mean, you have to work with the chaos that's in their life and not trying to control it. And then we need to be aware of the boundaries that the press ethics can hold in the environment. And we take on a responsibility in a good way, in our opinion, to challenge the press ethics a bit. Because for now, and I think this is what we're looking into, too many stories aren't told because people are demanding full anonymity. And if we are not losing up a bit on how much we're using anonymity, and how it's being, um, and in which format stories are told anonymously. There are a lot of stories that we actually miss. And this is a, a, a very sad from, the, from um, our point of view. And then we have to be aware that used to has to, has to die <laughs> because used to does not exist with the minority use because they're not trained journalists, they're not train camera men or women, we have to be aware of, how, of what they are suggesting uh, as a good suggestion as ours would be. These are the do's. And then we have the don'ts. And this is something, something that we've experienced because one thing that's important is that for us has been, and we've learned this by failing, that we shouldn't have any full-time hires because this is not motivating for them. We need to do this. And I think this is actually really parallel to what is happening with the ethical Danish youth. I mean, you're working project-based. And we have to work project-based because then a lot of the has-to task or the boring task or the administrative task and so forth has, has to be taken care of by people who are not the talents and who are... Um, yeah, who are people who are more skilled at that. Um, and we also need the flow of people and not the same time of people. We need people coming in and out and giving it this energy vibe. You have to have people coming in with energy to do something and execute it and then leave again and then come back when they had energy enough to something new. Um, and then new, not too tight deadlines. We really have to be realistic because these people are doing something else. They, they are not doing this as a full-time job. So they are either working on the side or they have friends to be with, their families to be with, their kids to be with themselves. I mean, this is not the center of their world. So we have to be realistic. This is also why we don't have a schedule of how, um, how often we publish something. We publish something when there's something good to publish. Uh, and then don't try to control the chaos. Every time we've tried to make structure 
every time we've tried to make control, the energy has fallen and people have dropped out of our collaboration. And then don't expect that the US will tell everything, everything on camera. And I think this is also very, it's very important. We've experimented a bit with podcasts because that's another environment. Uh, it's only your voice represented and you are, you can't and you will say a bit more, but there's still too many stories that aren't told. And this is so sad. And we need to challenge that on how these stories, we have to work with how these stories are then told when, in not, when it's not in front of a camera. Um, and then expect that it's not about only making content. It's about building a community and building a brand that's epic enough for you to be a part of the community. Um, and then you really have to have no judgment because if we would say that we cannot work with people involved with crime, we say that um, it's bad to get married when you were 15, then it actually removes us from a lot of people who are in environments where this is happening. So the judgment is really important because we have, when, when I say we, the ethnical Danes have a certain, can have a tendency to have a certain point of view of what is right and what is wrong. And if you are a criminal, this is wrong. <laughs> but many of the youths that we're working with who are involved with crime, this is just, this was the natural cause of life. This was, this is where they're at. And they can be great people with great stories to tell and to share. Yeah. So I think um, this is actually my presentation. And I think what is interesting for us is also to say that we right now in the strategic phase of saying what is scale of life has to be now. What, what, what does it have to transform to? Because we succeeded first of all now but then we have to move on as i said before and right now we're looking at how Gellerup, the name in itself could actually be a, a showstopper for some of the people that we want to work with because it's a certain area in in Aarhus that has a lot of uh, different vibes to it uh, it's a, it's a rural area in some opinions in some yeah in some eyes but um, we have to know, we have to ask ourselves: Is this the right name for it, for what we want to do, and all of that? So everything is up in the air, and it's landing by now. And we are working on the new Gallop Life in two thousand and twenty-three. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>